Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Glad you're with us here tonight. We're up to week 29 already, if you can believe that. And we finished the life of Christ last week. We're going to spend two weeks tonight and next week looking at the book of Acts. So that'll finish the history books of the New Testament, the life of Jesus in the Gospels, then the book of Acts follows the history. Now we read more of it in some of the letters, Paul's letters especially, which we'll start looking at two weeks from tonight, but tonight we start the book of Acts. Let's start with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, thanks. Thank you for giving us your word, giving us the story of Jesus, who he is, what he came to do, how he accomplished it. Lord, what it means for us, and how we are to live in response today. Thank you that that message didn't die when Jesus died or when he went back to heaven in the ascension, but he had trained those disciples to take the gospel and spread it around the world. And as we learn more about that tonight, again, I pray that we would be inspired, that our faith would be uh, engaged and deepened. Thank you, Father. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, uh, I got a couple pictures to show while some of you finish off the thing. So these are good. Technically, you know, Moses was the first person with a tablet downloading data from the cloud. I don't know if you knew that, that was technically speaking. All right, here you go. Here's a good reason you should get that extended warranty on your computer. So the poor. Yikes. <laughs> yeah. Not good. Okay, more ads. Here you go. Full-size mattress, Royal Tonic, 20-year warranty, like new, slight urine smell. <laughs> $40. Oh, gosh. Who would advertise? Use toilet paper. Like, seriously, who advertises these things? Found. Dirty white dog. Looks like a rat. It's been out a while. No collar. Better be a reward. <laughs> Isn't that great? Beautiful engagement ring, yellow gold, wide band with 18 diamonds set in three rows of three diamonds on each side of one large round cup center stone worn sparingly for only eight, nine days. It didn't mean anything. It was just supposed to shut her up. It didn't shut her up. Happy to be rid of it too for the first offer of $800. Wow. <laughs> Yikes. There's probably a little too much information. I don't know what you think. Free to good country home. Rottweiler, three-quarter Rottweiler, one-quarter shepherd, three years old, female, spade, lo very intelligent, loves to eat live rabbits and kittens. <laughs> loves to play ball with kids. Yeah, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Yo, man. All right. One more, one more. Who knows what the safest place in Canada is? You're close. Near here. It's actually any Tim Hortons in the country. <laughs> Safest. <laughs> All right. All that's just for fun, of course. Okay, let's take up our exam. We finished the uh, life of Christ, five weeks in the life of Christ after a week of the gospel, so six weeks. And a little quiz there here quickly. Is, not, is that blue paper? Blue? All right. If you're at home, of course, it should be attached to the email where you got the link to be watching right now, so grab that. All right, quickly match the list on the left and the list on the right, placing the correct letter in the blanks. Matthew is H, shows Christ as king. Good. Mark is C, shows Christ as the servant with power. Luke is E, shows Christ as the perfect God-man. Uh, John is... F shows Christ as Savior. Good. A, I mean, <laughs> gospel means, okay, good news. Gospel is A, good news. Jews would be B, Matthew's audience, right? Romans is I, Mark's audience. Greeks would be G, uh, Luke's audience. And the world would be D, John's audience. Okay, give yourself a mark out of uh, 14. I don't know why, but whatever you want. Okay, multiple choice. Ready? Multiple choice. Uh, choose the best possible answer. Uh, the I am of Jesus. Which one would it be? D, all of the above. That's right. D, all of the above. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the true vine. I am the light of the world and many more. All right, number two. The synoptic gospels would be which three? 
B, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke are the synoptic gospels. Why do we call them the synoptic gospels? Anybody? They see sin, sin is together. Optic is to see. They see things the same. They see things together. All right. They, care, they, they include most of the same material, right? And who remembers? Is it later? Yeah, it is. Never mind. All right. Number three, the shortest gospel would be B, Mark. That's right. Only 16 chapters. The rest are all 20 or more. Uh, the gospel with 90% unique material would be D, John. That's right. 90% unique. We're going to talk more about that in the next couple of Sundays. Uh, number five, the gospel with the key phrase, kingdom of heaven, would be A, A Matthew. That's right. Matthew, right to the Jews, show Jesus as king. Good. And number six, the gospel with the key phrase, son of man, C, Luke, son of man. Okay, and then number seven, the reason Christians gather to worship on Sundays instead of Saturdays is D, it's the day Jesus exited the grave, the resurrection day. Did I say that wrong? Oh, there are two C's, two, two C's. The second C, which should be D. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. Yeah. I do have to work Mondays, and Saturday is too busy. No, none of that. All right, got it? Okay, on the, uh, the, on the back side of the page, you get a chance to get around to that? No. Okay, come on, Brian. Okay. I'll say the stage, and you guys say the three sub-points, the three main points in the stage. Ready? Incarnation, virgin birth, visited by shepherds, veneration temple. Okay, the stage of nothing. Okay, yep, worship by magi, wild teachers, where is he? Okay, how old is the first stage of incarnation? How old? Did I say how old? How long? Yes. <laughs> 40 days. And how long is the stage of nothing? 30 years. Then the stage of confirmation. It's Jesus confirmed that he is the Messiah by God at his baptism, by Satan at his temptation, and by nature at the first miracle. Good. How long is that stage? First year of his ministry. That's right. And then affirmation to others. Three A's. What are they? Authoritative teaching, awesome power, appoints apostles. Good. And then how long is that stage? Uh, another year, the second year. And Jesus is extremely popular here. These first two years, boy, oh boy, the crowds are gathering. And so that leads into the stage of rejection, right? And he's rejected at Nazareth, then by the church leaders, by, and then... By many disciples, yeah, John 6, you know, they just can't handle what he's teaching and saying, and many left. All right, then the stage of notification, three T's, what are they? Thou art the Christ, and transfiguration, and 72, sending out the 72, good. And how long is that stage? Six months, six months, and then six months for antagonism, all right. I know people that live in that stage their whole lives antagonism. All right, three A's again. What are they? Arise, Lazarus. Angers church leaders and anointed by Mary just a half dozen days before Passover. Okay, and then P is, or the, <laughs> the, P, the Passion Week. Five T's. What are they? Starts with triumphal entry, then the temple cleansing, which we know is the next day, then the toughest teaching, probably over several days, then the Last Supper, and then the crucifixion. It is cheating to use T's for the, right? That's okay. All right, and then finally, exaltation. Absolutely. What are the three E's? Empty tomb or Easter, you pick. And then 11 appearances, and then he is elevated the ascension. Okay, very good. All right. Good stuff. We might uh, revisit that with a quiz down the road, not next week. Okay, 
How much will you give me if there's no quiz next week? <laughs> All right, let's look at the book of Acts. Are right, you ready? Everybody ready to go? All right, page 119 in your workbook, 119, the book of Acts, part one. In this lesson, we'll study the first 10 chapters of the book of Acts, actually the first 12 chapters, and we'll learn of the beginnings of the early church and of the key figure in the first half, Simon Peter. All right, so quick questions. What do you like about Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2? The day of Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit comes in the church, the church is born. What do you like about his sermon that day? He seized the moment. Absolutely. Carpe diem, Peter. What else? He invited people to repent and seek God's forgiveness. And did anybody do that? 3,000 3, people that day. That's a pretty good sermon, I think. Yeah. All right. Good, let's move on to what was the early church wholly devoted in Acts 2, 42 to 47? Teaching, fellowship, prayer, worship. Teaching, fellowship, prayer, worship, the Lord's, Supper. the Lord's Supper. Yeah, which they would have equated with worship. Okay, very good. Uh, what do you learn about the early church and today's church as you read the choosing of the seven, seven deacons in uh, Acts chapter 6? They weren't perfect. That's right. Isn't it interesting? Huh? Human nature has not changed. A little dispute between this group and this group in a church. Who? What? Goodness. Yeah. Okay. Good. We won't mention the fact that it was the ladies, but okay, number four. I'm, I'm just walking on dangerous ground and teasing. So. Number four. Who was scattered by the persecution? The church, not all the church. Okay, all the lay people, like the professionals that were trained directly by Jesus, the apostles, they were staying. And what happened as they went and as they scattered from the persecution? What did they do? Spread the gospel. They preached the gospel. Almost makes you wonder if God knew, and uh, you heard the phrase, light a fire on somebody, under somebody, if the persecution lit the fire under them to get them go and, you know, and share. And uh, yeah, I think so. God knows it all. Okay, so let's talk about the, uh, the book of Acts here into the class notes, page 119. A couple of things. First, the title of the book. It's... A lot of uh, translations in English will say the Acts, just simply Acts, or the Acts of the Apostles, which is a pretty poor title. It probably should say the Acts of the Holy Spirit, because there are really only a few of the Apostles that are named in the book. Okay, there's only a few that are highlighted. Peter and John early, yeah, James gets killed in chapter 12. And uh, so it's the acts of the Holy Spirit throughout the whole book, all right? Uh, and that's the idea. The Holy Spirit comes, power is there too. Who's the author of the book? Well, Luke. What do you remember about Luke? He's a doctor. What else? Medical doctor, physician, anything else? He wrote, he wrote the Gospel of Luke. That's a good one, yeah. <laughs> Somebody said lots of detail, and that's, that's true. That's very accurate as well, probably because he's a doctor. And careful, be careful. You don't want a doctor who doesn't care about details. Oops, did I leave a sponge in you? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Whoops, <laughs> detail, detail, okay? Good, very thorough, detailed, orderly, right? Because I'm sure a lot of that flows out of the fact that he is a doctor, okay? Good, so in your notes, any of those things you want to write down. Wrote the Gospel of Luke, yes. Doctor, orderly, very detailed, all the same things that you guys have already said. Good, so he is writing. He is writing first the Gospel of Luke, right? All the life of Jesus. And then the sequel. Like, did you know that the book of Acts is the sequel? Yeah. It's the sequel. He's writing to the same guy. That's our next one. Here's what happened afterwards. Who's the recipients of the book? Well, it's listed to one guy. His name is Theophilus. Theophilus. 
lover of God, okay, Theophilus is his name. And so we see Luke addresses him in Luke chapter 1. He addresses him right here in Acts chapter 1. He says, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, sorry, to the apostles he had chosen. Right? So it's written. Now, it says uh, in Luke, he calls him most excellent Theophilus. So that's a title, most excellent. So he was undoubtedly a Greek official. Theophilus, that's a Greek name, means, you know, lover of God. And most excellent would have been uh, a high official, a Greek official that he's writing to. Uh, Tom Miller was just talking to me before we started tonight. And Tom helps with the junior youth on Wednesday nights. And so his, the Bible study that he's in, they were just looking at this. Um, and uh, the author that, he, that, that was t- telling them about the, gospel of, the book of Acts was saying that, that one theory of who Theophilus is that Luke is writing to is that Theophilus was the lawyer for the apostle Paul. Now, we know that Luke is with Paul on many of his journeys, and by the end of the book of Acts, you know, Paul's in prison and uh, kind of ends abruptly in Acts 28, and so seems to be some indication, I've never seen it, but that, you know, maybe this was the lawyer for the Apostle Paul. I don't know. That was a new one on me, I've heard, but we really don't know who he is or anything much about him, but Paul's writing, Luke is writing to him two different books. Okay, good. Uh, The key words, now it says one and two in your notes. Uh, You can add a three and four there below. There's room. Uh, Many key words in the book of Acts, but these are two that are probably the ones uh, that we want to know most. First, the Holy Spirit. If indeed the book should be more rightly titled The Acts of the Holy Spirit, well, the Holy Spirit's found 70 times in this book. Okay, is named 70 times in this book. Holy Spirit, right? And then uh, witnesses, 30 times it talks about witnesses, all right? So this book is written about the stuff that happened in the next uh, 30, 40 years after Jesus went back to heaven. I mean, starting like real soon after, well, starting with him going back to heaven and then over the next 30, 40 years. And so there are witnesses. And uh, when Paul is writing his letters, which we'll get to in a couple of weeks, Paul says, and these guys are still alive, and you can check with these guys. They're eyewitnesses, too. Now, there are two key uh, players in the gospel, or in the, the book of Acts, right? First is Simon Peter, who we're starting tonight, and Simon Peter is named 70 times in the book, all right? The first 12 chapters. And then in the next 16 chapters, the Apostle Paul, who is named Saul, but changes his name to Paul, 200 times he is named here in the book of Acts. Key, key guy. All right? Good. All right, just background stuff. So Simon Peter is the key guy in the first half, we'll call it half, the first 12 chapters, and then the the focus switches to the Apostle Paul in the second half of the book. All right, the key verse of the book is Acts 1.8. It's the key verse, it's also in the outline of the book. You know what I'm having you do? It's uh, printed there in your notes, right? Let's read it together. Okay, read it out, out loud with me. One, two, three. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Okay? So that's the key verse because it's about the spread of the gospel. And, and how does it happen? First, They're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, then they are witnesses. Remember, these are the two key words, right? Holy Spirit and witnesses. And then where? Well, you start where you are, right here in Jerusalem. And then all of Judea, which would be all of the province that you're in. And then Samaria, the next province. And then to the ends of the earth. And so that's actually how the book is written. So it's not just the key verse, but it's also an outline of the book too. So they start in Jerusalem, right where they are, right in the center. 
Okay? And then they go to Judea, which is the province they're in, and then to Samaria, right, which is the next province right beside them, and then finally to the ends of the earth. Just keep going and don't stop. Right? So if that was here, what would we say? You will be, you'll receive the power of the Holy Spirit, and you'll be my witnesses in Guelph, and then in Ontario, and then in Quebec or Manitoba, and then to the ends of the earth. Yeah, okay? So that's the idea. And as we look at the book of Acts, we see that happen, okay? It starts there in Jerusalem, and then later we see Philip going to Samaria, okay? Well, and then they spread out, and then Philip goes to Samaria, and then the rest of the book, Paul takes it to, well, the rest of the known world uh, in his lifetime. All right, so the book of Acts really is two stories in one book, two very clear distinctions, and that's how we will separate part one tonight and part two next week. All right? I was going to adjust these slides, but I think they're all right. No, I'm thinking of Sunday sermon. Never mind. All right. Acts 1, one they kind of blend together sometimes. Okay, we're going to look at chapters 1 to 12 tonight and then 13 to 28 next week. In chapters 1 to 12, Peter is the main guy. Okay, Simon Peter. He is the main fellow that we'll be looking at here, okay? And then in chapter 13 to 28, it's Paul, okay, the Apostle Paul. In the first half, the focus is Israel, which includes Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. They're all in Israel. And then the next half is the rest of the world. Paul is going up to Antioch, which would be in Syria today, and then he goes over to Crete, and then he goes up to what's today's Turkey, and eventually over to Greece and Italy. And, and he, he says in one of his letters that he wants to go to Spain, and there's some indication you know, in history that it did. It's not in the Bible that he did, so goes to the rest of the world. Number three, uh, another focus in Acts 1 to 12 is the persecution. It culminates in persecution, which spreads them out. It just drives them out so they can go share the gospel. Whereas in the second half, it's about the church speaking, preaching, and teaching, and planting churches. Okay? In uh, the first half, the focus is on the Jews. Jesus was a Jew. A lot of people are shocked to hear that, which surprises me, I guess. But uh, what? I thought he was a Christian. <laughs> no, serious, serious. Yes, of course, he was, you could say, the first Christian, if you will. He is the Christ, but he was a Jew, and the 12 apostles were all Jews, and the people he was generally preaching to at first was Jews, and, and the one person comes, you know, and, and uh, Jesus really isn't going to pay much attention, and she says, well, wait, you know, even the dogs get crumbs from the table, and like, wow, like she knew that a lot of the Jews considered you know, Gentiles to be dogs. It's very interesting. But then the second half is about the, uh, the Gentiles. Now, part of that starts in chapter 10 with Cornelius, the first Gentile convert. Mm, that's not really true. Well, it is true. Do we consider Samaritans Jews or Gentiles? You were all here Sunday, right? Yeah, they're half and half, aren't they? Which is, you know, What? Anyway, so Cornelius is considered kind of the first Gentile, him and his family, which we'll get to next week. No, tonight. Tonight, tonight. All right, so the focus then goes on to the Gentiles, all right? And then uh, the first part is miracles. Uh, Peter, John, there are lots of miracles that are happening. And of course, there's teaching daily in the temple courts and in homes, house to house. Uh, but in the second half, uh, there are still some miracles that are happening, but it's more the spoken word, the preached word that's emphasized in the second half. Okay? All right, so that's kind of, there's two stories, and uh, so this is what we'll look at this week, and that's what we'll look at next week as we uh, walk through. All right, let's talk about the Apostle Peter. He is the main guy, the focus in the first half, the first 12 chapters. Um, these are, this is one statue, actually, from a couple of different views at the Vatican in Rome. Peter's always carrying, holding the two keys. Remember why? 
What did Jesus say? Who do people say that I am? Oh, Elijah, some other prophet. Who do you say I am? And what does Peter say in, in King James English? Thou art the Christ, the what? Son of the living God, okay? And so Jesus says, yeah, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, only my Father who is in heaven. I'm changing your name to Peter, rock, and on this rock I'll build my church. I give you the keys to the kingdom, right? So there's always seen with two keys in his hand, all right? Uh, here's another statue of St. Peter, always with two keys in his hand. This next one is maybe the oldest depiction of Peter. It goes all the way back to the 500s, the 6th century, you know, in this monastery. And again, you see the, the keys in his hand here. So, because he's significant. Jesus says, I'm going to build my church on this rock, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. So, what is he like? What is Peter like? Just tell me what you... Now, actually... Actually, I think there are two Peters in the sense of it's the same guy, but he's kind of one way before the resurrection. And after Jesus' resurrection, remember he meets him on the, the shore of Galilee and Jesus has the fish breakfast. I showed you a picture of where that took place like re earlier and, and uh, he's a different guy after that. He's a different guy here in the book of Acts. What was he like earlier? Peter 1.0, what was he like? Impulsive, brash, what else? Sorry? A try hard, yeah, okay. Spoke before he thought, absolutely. At times cowardly, right? I didn't know him. I don't know that guy, right? And what's he like afterwards? Okay, let's talk about this. In your notes, uh, you got one, two, three, four. So there's a left and a right. Before, in the Gospels, he said wrong things, okay? But after the resurrection, he had all the right words, including there on Pentecost Sunday when, holy cow, this message is amazing, and 3,000 people come to Jesus. From a guy who always said the wrong thing, it seemed... I mean, even when it said the right thing, <laughs> Jesus says, yeah, that wasn't you. That was my father <laughs> through you. <laughs> How'd you like that? If every time you did something right, you didn't get the credit. Ah. Also, Peter, before the resurrection, he was always wavering. But after the resurrection, he is now the rock. No, not Dwayne Johnson. Who said that? <laughs> not that rock he is now the rock all right before the resurrection he's leading he is the leader of the group but it's in his own wisdom okay in his own wisdom but after the resurrection and you know what i want to i want to kind of couple together the resurrection seeing jesus alive holy cow he is the god he is god look at this but then couple that with the power of the holy spirit 10 days later right no 50 days later yeah, 50 days after the resurrection, 10 days after the ascension. Okay, so now he's a leader, but it's in the power of the Holy Spirit. So he is a leader, but now it's just not his own try to figure it out kind of wisdom. It's the power of the Holy Spirit in him <clears throat> and all these guys. And then one more, uh, before the resurrection, he's weak. And now after the resurrection, he is bold. He is bold. And he goes from denying Jesus, you know, the night of his trials, res arrest and trials, to not caring if he gets arrested and whipped and beaten in chapter 4 and 5, which you read for tonight, right? Doesn't care. Go ahead. I, you're not going to stop us from talking about Jesus. Wow. That's, what a difference, right? What a difference. And that is only 50-some days later. Well, no, in the temple courts would be... Shortly after that. All right, so let me just, so you've written, you've filled in that. Let me just uh, quickly sh expand on that a little bit. In the Gospels, he's naturally impulsive. You know, like somebody said, speak first, think later. I can uh, relate to that. He's presumptuous at times and uh, running out and just, you know, doing things before he knew the right thing. He was timid and cowardly at times, like there uh, at Jesus' arrest and trial. If you want to take a picture of this, you can. 
sometimes he's self-seeking, okay, for sure. And sometimes he's slow to comprehend the deeper truths. So there are biblical examples of all of these uh, as well. All right. You know what? A couple of people have asked me about this. If any of you want to give me a flash drive, it probably should be, I don't know, 64 will gigabyte will help, will do it. 128, I think, should. I would be happy to give you all of these PowerPoint files, like all 38 of them, and then you can have them and you can go back anytime if you've got PowerPoint on your you know, tablet or on your laptop or whatever. Okay, so if anybody wants these, I'm happy to, I'll be happy to give them to you, okay? Give me a flash drive. I should, okay. All right, I'll have to see how big it is. It's, it'll be a big flash drive, you know, so, but anyway. All right, and what's he like afterwards, okay? How is he different in the book of Acts after the resurrection, after the filling of the Holy Spirit? Well, he's the rock now, right? He is the rock that Jesus said after the Holy Spirit comes on you what it says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He becomes courageous. He's going to stand up and speak for Jesus even if they're going to whip him, and he knows they're going to as well. He's immovable, all right? And he's doing miracles, which we see like in chapter 3, coupled in chapter 5, chapter 9, a couple more. There are miracles. It's the power of God. Does Peter do miracles? It's God doing the miracles through him, right? Yeah. Okay. So this is the Peter. He is the main guy in the first half of the book of Acts. All right. Now that we've got that under our belt, there's that picture again. Wow. Hard to believe that picture is 1,500 years old, isn't it? Think about that, 1,500 years old. Wow, 6th century. All right, so let's talk about this. The first half of the book of Acts, there are a number of things that we're going to, uh, to look at. Uh, here's what we're going to look at. We'll come back to each of these individually. First, uh, in chapter 1, the naming of a replacement apostle, because who's missing now? Jesus. Judas, what happened to him? Yeah, he committed suicide, yeah, for sure, okay? And then in chapter 2, the coming of the Holy Spirit, day of Pentecost, the birth of the, of the church, and then chapters uh, 3, 4, 5, you got the apostles before the Sanhedrin because they've been out preaching and teaching and they're arrested. Chapter 6, you have the choosing of the, uh, the first deacons. You have the first dispute in the church and the first uh, resolution of that. We'll get some deacons to take care of these issues. And then chapter 7... Uh, is the stoning of one of those first seven deacons named Stephen, okay? And that's all chapter seven, and by the end of that, a great persecution breaks out, okay? That's uh, the seventh thing. And then number eight, we'll be looking at how the Holy Spirit is given to the Gentiles. Some people call this the Gentile Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes on Cornelius, the Roman uh, centurion. All right, so that's what we're going to look at here tonight. We'll look at several of them now, take a break, then we'll look at several more. And here's the first one. Right there in chapter 1, we've already read the uh, focus of the book. Jesus ascends back to heaven, and he says to them, uh, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So that's the that's the outline of the book, as well as the key verse of the book. After this, he was taken up before their very eyes, a cloud hidden from the sight, and so that's the case. And the rest of chapter 1, that you, which you read, uh, they figure, okay, did I read this? He said to them, verse 4, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. What was the key word there? Wait. Wait. <laughs> okay, they're on the Mount of Olives, up Jesus goes, go back to Jerusalem, wait there. Don't do anything till you get the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Because if you don't have the Holy Spirit... What power, what strength, what understanding, what discernment do you have? Your own, right? Human. Everybody following me? 
But these guys, they're sitting around day seven, day eight, twiddling their thumbs. Well, you know what? We're actually kind of missing a guy. We should pick somebody to replace Judas. What happened to wait? Okay, sorry. I'm, I'm kind of letting my thoughts about this get out. Kind of, right? You, can you guess what I'm thinking here about this? Anyway, so they sit down, and they're going to name a replacement for Judas before they have the Holy Spirit. Just let me throw that out there. All right, quick question. Instantly, I don't know. Maybe to see if they would wait. <laughs> yep, yep, true. True, I don't know. Doesn't tell us why. Okay, so what's the criterion for this new apostle to replace Judas? This is what they said. This is uh, Acts 1, 21, 22. Therefore, it's necessary for us to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. Wow, so the whole three and a half years. Somebody that's been with us from the very beginning. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. That makes sense, doesn't it? Somebody that's with us the whole time, especially somebody that witnessed him alive, his resurrection, okay? Um, I thought there were two. Oh, no, I'm ahead. Okay, so uh, how was the new man chosen then? This is, wow, look at this. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. So they whittled it down to two guys, two guys that had been with them since the very beginning, fit that criterion. Uh, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the 11 apostles. They cast lots. Now, what is casting lots, okay? What do we know about casting of lots? Well, before the Holy Spirit, am I making this clear? Before the Holy Spirit came, this was a primary way of making decisions where, you know, there was a pair of dice there, but it's, you know, like you draw the short straw, you know, those various kinds of things. It goes all the way back to the Old Testament, the Urim and the Thummim, okay? Thummim. <clears throat> so here's what that was. The high priest had a little pocket in his leather vestment, and in that pocket was kept two identically sized and shaped polished stones, one that was white and one that was black, okay? And so if King David or some king, you know, really wanted to inquire of the Lord, they would pray just like this, Lord, show us. And the high priest would say, okay, God, you know, if it's if it's yes, go ahead and attack the Philistines. Then we pull out the white stone. <laughs> and if it's no, then we'll pull out the black stone. And, you know, and they trusted. They trusted that God was behind that. And they would pull out, you know, God would have the high priest pull out the right stone. Okay? And they went by that. They lived by that. And I, on it, okay, as much as I'm you know, having some fun with this. I, I, I think God used that. I think God actually did speak to them through that, okay? And drawing the short straw, that kind of stuff. God actually did use that stuff, spoke to them until the Holy Spirit came, and then they had the Holy Spirit in them to guide and direct them and lead them. Question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, why? So the question is, why did they feel the need to ha add another apostle? Well, I, I, I don't think they were wrong, okay? I just think they were, I don't think they were wrong that there needed to be another apostle, okay? Because you think of the number 12, right? There's this sense of completion there with that number, and you've got the 12 tribes, and there's 12s in these in various places. I just think they were supposed to wait, and they didn't. Because I think God himself actually chose the 12th apostle, which we'll see next week. Who would that be? Paul. Saul. It becomes Paul. I, that, this, this is my opinion. This isn't in the Bible. But they were told to wait. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. They're casting lots. And by the way, after this, the Holy Spirit comes, and never again do they cast lots to make a decision. 
because they have the Holy Spirit. You got that? Never again is the casting of lots uh, the way they make a decision because they have the Holy Spirit. So, okay. It's the last time lots are used to make decisions. Why? Because today and shortly after that, Believers have the Holy Spirit to lead us, to guide us, to direct us, to help us in these decisions. All right. Now we have the Holy Spirit to guide us. So this fellow who they choose by casting lots, um, his name is Matthias, and we never hear about him again. Now we don't hear about most of the 12 again, but nevertheless. So, okay. Okay. All right, good. By the way, in, uh, we have, in the United Brethren Church, we have roots in a number of different denominations, including very, very different denominations, and, and one of them is Mennonite. We've got some Mennonite roots, and uh, one of our early founders was chosen to be the pastor of his little country church, and uh, the former pastor moved away, and so here's what they did. They lined up all the men of the church at the front. Okay, all the men come up here, and they lined them up, and they all handed in their Bibles, and they wrote a verse down, and uh, the verse was something about, I forget what exactly the verse is, but something about, you know, God's wonderful choice or whatever, and they stuck it in one of the Bibles, and they all grabbed a Bible, and the one who opened the Bible and had the verse, congratulations, you win or lose or whatever, you're the next pastor, you start preaching next week, you know, so... (laughs) Which is, you know, like with the random Bibles, that's kind of like casting lots again, right? But they, again, just like these guys, they did pray first, say, okay, God, show us who our next pastor is. So um, my proposal is when I retire, that's what we, all of you guys get ready. So, no, no. All right, let's move along. Did they choose an apostle too soon? It's a big debate. It's a big debate. And uh, I think they did, but nobody cares what I think, so... All right, good. Uh, All right, so that's chapter one. Chapter two, ready? Chapter two is the key chapter of Acts because it's the coming of the Holy Spirit, and it could be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit, and they should have waited, and uh, it's the Holy Spirit that empowers and leads and directs the rest of the way. Hopefully us today, too. So chapter two now is on the Feast of Pentecost. In Hebrew, it's the Feast of Weeks that happens, right? And uh, it's one of the seven feast days from Leviticus 23, which we talked about a fair bit last week or two weeks ago. No, it was last week, right? All right. So you got three feasts in the spring, Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and Feast of First Fruits. And then 50 days after Feast of First Fruits is the Feast of Weeks. It's seven weeks, you know, 49 days. And on the next day, also a Sunday, Feast of First Fruits is always a Sunday, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day. And then that's the, that's the start of the harvest, right? The shoots have come out. The seed has fallen to the ground and died. And now here it comes, the promise. And 50 days later, it's kind of the, the, the winter wheat or the spring wheat, different names. And, and now it's ready to harvest here. 50 days later, ready? And, uh, and so the Holy Spirit, it's the harvest of the church as the Holy Spirit comes upon the church, right? So Pentecost, Pent, so it's 50, it's 50 days later from Feast of First Fruits to the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost, and it's God's perfect timing again. Jesus fulfills by sending the Holy Spirit, fulfills these feast days, each one on the exact day. Now, Three feast days in the spring, this one 50 days later, and then three feast days in the fall. And if you were a Jewish man in that day, you came to Jerusalem, if you could, you know, for a Pentecost, for Passover, and for this feast, Pentecost, and for uh, the fall feasts as well. All right? The middle one, I think. Uh, yeah, for Yom Kippur. Uh, now I'm fuzzy on that last one. Anyway, one in each. So people would have been here in Jerusalem, not only from all over Israel, but you would make a pilgrimage. You would come, if you lived down in Africa, if you lived in Greece or Turkey or Rome or somewhere, if you were a Jew of the diaspora, you're scattered all over, you would come back. 
And, uh, and Pentecost was one of the big ones where you would come back. And of course, God's perfect timing, the Holy Spirit comes, the, the uh, gospel is preached, and there are people from all around the known world there to hear the gospel. All right? And then the, what are they going to do? They're going to go back and they're going to share it with their families. Okay? So now here is the traditional location of the upper room in, uh, in Jerusalem. This is a picture from my camera. This is uh, when I was in the room. This is a better picture of it from my camera. Um, <clears throat> but it's not. Like they'll... they'll if you go and you're on a tour or whatever, they'll take you here and say, this is the spot, you know, we're told. But that architecture is from like a thousand years later. So it's probably not. But again, like I've told you before, if you go, if you get a chance to go, do go. And even if there's a question about, is this really where it happened? Okay, you're, don't worry about that. This is, the Holy Spirit came on the church here in Jerusalem, maybe in this room. Thank you, Lord. Right? Follow me? We celebrate what happened, not, not, not where necessarily. Although a lot of places, this, that is the Mount of Olives. That is the Garden of Gethsemane. That is. So a lot of places, perfect, you know where it is. All right. So this is the traditional place, they tell you, where the upper room was uh, when they came. All right, good. So let's talk about it. It's the coming of the Holy Spirit, and uh, I think we, we need to read it. And uh, you can, I'll read. You can jot down some of these main points. All right, uh, chapter 2 here, Brian. All right, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Or, if you prefer, the King James talks about they were in a Honda. They were all in one accord. Thank you, thank you. Uh, suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven. And filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began speak to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Okay, let me stop right there. So there are a couple of things for your notes here. They're all gathered in one place. All right. And uh, who was that? Certainly it was the twelve. <clears throat> and there were probably 120 that were up there, uh, so more than just the 12, a whole bunch of the disciples. And eventually, thousands follow this sound, and they come and gather, and Peter, Peter preaches to them, right? And they saw tongues of fire come through the room and separate, and on top of each of them too. And then it says they began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So let's chat about that for, for a moment. There are a couple of possibilities of what this means. There are two views. We'll talk about this idea of speaking in tongues more when we get to uh, First and Second Corinthians in a few weeks. Uh, one view is this, that the, the, uh, the speaking in tongues is a gift of God to give a heightened awareness of the worship of God, and you're speaking in a language that you never learned that you don't know. It's the Holy Spirit allowing you to speak some language you didn't learn. Now, let's talk about that briefly. We'll come back to that more later. Oh, you're all writing furiously. Okay, give you a moment. Okay, so um, it seems in the Bible that there are a couple of a couple of ways this happened. First, I need to tell you that the word tongues is simply the Greek word which means language. All right, so Paul could have said, "Hey, I speak in three different tongues." I speak tongues. I speak in tongues. I speak in Aramaic. I speak Hebrew. I speak Greek. He might have spoke Latin as well. I mean, he was a highly learned man. We know for sure he spoke Aramaic, Greek, Latin. Greek was what everybody spoke as you traveled around and probably spoke Latin too. He was a Roman citizen. So we know these things. And you wouldn't have said languages. The word was tongues. All these languages, the word is tongues. I speak 
various tongues, various languages. But as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, you know this verse, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, or of angels, but have not lum, love, I'm a resounding gong, clanging cymbal. So Paul seems to say there that there are human language, and then there's some kind of heavenly language, right? The language of angels and stuff. So there are people that would say, you know, sometimes God gives this gift of speaking a language they never learned, and it's amazing. And you do hear those stories throughout history, and even in modern days where some missionary is somewhere, and there's some life and death situation, and like, they speak the language of the people, and how on earth did this happen? It, it's, like, it's a miraculous thing. You do hear those, uh, those testimonies, those stories of it happening. And indeed, that's what's happening here. Let's keep reading, okay? Let's keep reading. It says, uh, the Holy Spirit allowed them to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, enabled them. Now, keep reading. Verse 5. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. All right? So this wasn't gibberish. It wasn't like some heavenly language or anything. In this case, utterly amazed, they asked, are not these, all these men who are speaking Galileans? Now, Sundays, what did they think of Galileans? Hillbillies, hicks, unlearned, unlearned at all. Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, our own languages. So in this case, on the day of Pentecost, what they were, the Holy Spirit allowed them, these unlearned fishermen, Galileans, to speak the praises of God in languages from all of these different languages, from all these different places in the Roman world, all these different, three different continents, if you look there, and uh, that. So there's that. Um, yeah. Again, Paul, Paul seems to talk about a, you know, speaking in the tongues of angels as well. We'll maybe get to more of that when we get to 1 Corinthians. Now, another idea, uh, this is called cessationalism, cessation to cease, to stop. It says that this was an apostolic gift just for then, for the apostles, and then when the last apostle died, it died out. So they would say, this is not anything that happens today. It's not for today. It was just for the apostles to get the church started. Um, some people believe this would also say miracles stopped. The miracles were just then for the apostles. Healings and other miracles stopped when the apostles died because they were just there to kind of kick off the church and get it going. So no more healing, no more miracles, no more speaking in tongues since the apostles were gone. So now one of the verses they quote, it says, uh, when there were tongues, in 1 Corinthians 13 again, where there are tongues, they'll be stilled. Um, but it also says, when there's knowledge, it will pass away. And I don't think knowledge has passed away. So anyway, all right, good. I won't ask her questions now because it could take the rest of our night. But we'll come back to this in a couple of weeks when we get to 1 Corinthians. What was that situation called? Um, 1 Corinthians 13? Uh, verse 1 talks about the tongues of men and of angels. Um, Paul talks a lot about this in chapters 12, 13, and 14. But 13 talks about when there's knowledge, it'll be passed away, tongues will be stilled. Okay. Okay, but he's talking about when we get to heaven, right? When we get to heaven, that's what that's talking about. All right, uh, why did all this happen? The Holy Spirit coming on the church, the tongues of fire, speaking in tongues. Why did all this happen? Well, when it's over, verse 12 says, amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, this is all these people that came from all over town because they heard the sound and they followed it, right? Thousands and thousands. What does this mean? So God was drawing people to come to hear, to see this, to find Jesus. 
at this time, right? So this was a powerful witness to the power of the Holy Spirit. The birth of the church. Hey, when you have a birthday, you want to invite people, don't you? So God is inviting people to come to the birth of the church. And 3,000 join that day. Which I think is pretty cool. Now, after that part, Peter speaks up. Now, some people see this and they go, oh my goodness, look at these guys, they're drunk. <laughs> right? Like they're, how, look at these guys, babbling and babbling, but all the people from other countries are going, oh, I hear them in my Egyptian land. I hear them in Latin. I'm from Rome. I hear them from Mesopotamia. Remember between the, between the rivers, Mesopotamia. I, I, others just say, what? I don't understand these languages. You know, like it's just nonsense, gibberish. These guys are drunk. And Peter says, no way. It's only nine in the morning. We don't start drinking until 10. No, 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 he didn't say that. It's nine in the morning. We're not drunk. No, 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 no. All right. And so then Peter, I think, quiets the crowd, which by this point, they're not all in the upper room, obviously, because there are thousands, multiple thousands who've come. And I don't know where he's standing, you know, at this point, but he preaches this sermon starting, it's a great sermon, if you want to say that, and 3,000 people come to Christ, and he starts with Joel, okay, where Joel prophesied that... In the last days, God would pour out his spirit on all people. Okay, Joel chapter 2, verse 28 to 32. We're going to read this in a moment, okay? Verse 38, we read where Peter replied. Here's the key. Peter replied. Okay, so after this sermon, he gives this great sermon, wonderful, and when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And then verse 38, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. All right, so here's where it starts. Peter starts his big sermon by looking back to Joel chapter 2, which uh, Joel, this was Joel's prophecy. And afterwards, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young women will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Now, remember in the Old Testament who had the Holy Spirit? just the leaders that God chose for a particular job, right? Did everybody have the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament? No, this is part of the new covenant. God will pour out his spirit. This is Joel, hundreds and hundreds of years before, and now this happens here on the day of Pentecost. And Paul says, God, God knew, God prophesied this, men, women, old, young, everybody, even my servants, not just the prophets, not just the kings, not just the guys making the tabernacle. No, I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness. Now, some of this will be later at the very end times. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, remember, it always means judgment. The day of the Lord is not the good time. All right? And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the survivors whom the Lord calls. So there is a, there's a two parts to this prophecy. The Holy Spirit coming on the church, new covenant, all right? And then later when Jesus comes back, the rest of this stuff will happen too. All right. So 3,000 come to Christ. It's amazing. It's wonderful. And so what are they doing now? And these are people from all over the place, and some do not want to go home, you know, back to Greece or Turkey or Rome or Egypt, whatever, you know, back to Iran today. They don't want to go home. This is amazing. The, I mean, the, the 12 are there, and they're teaching and preaching, and they just want to stay there and lap it up and learn and grow, and, and good for them, uh, at least till we get to chapter 8, good for them, and here are the things that are happening. If you're still there in Acts chapter 2, let me read 42 to 47. You already read all this. They devoted themselves to the... Well, let me back up. Uh, those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. 
Now, verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, communion, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So in your notes, I've got a little bit of a, an acrostic there. See, bride? We're the bride of Christ. The church is born. It's the bride of Christ. So here's what was happening in those days. They devoted themselves to B, biblical instruction. Okay, to the apostles' teaching, it says. Biblical instruction. R, to relationships, fellowship with each other. Growing, helping, serving together with glad and sincere hearts, praying God. So biblical instructions are relationships. I, intercession or prayer, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. The apostles' teaching to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. D, devotion, if you will, or worship. This is to spell bride. And then E, to evangelism. The Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. They're out sharing their faith with others too. People are coming to Christ. Super exciting stuff. Okay. Uh, let's take a break. Uh, six or seven minutes, and then we will continue with the next few chapters and how they are, are, are indeed out there preaching, but then they get arrested and tried and whipped and beaten. Yay! How fun. All right. Take a quick break. I'll go back to this slide in case any of you didn't quite get it all.
All right, come on back. We're going to start. Come back, come back. All right. Good, good. Okay. Chapter 1, Jesus says, wait, the Holy Spirit will come. Chapter 2, the Holy Spirit does come. 3,000 people come to faith that day. They're gathering. They're worshiping. The biblical instruction, relationships, intercession, prayer, devotion. There's worship, breaking of bread, evangelism. This is happening daily. People are coming to Christ. Now, one day, go to chapter 3. Peter and John go to the temple. They see this, uh, this fellow who's an invalid. He's been crippled, and he calls for alms, and Peter says, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have I'll give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And I, and I love it. The Bible says he went walking and leaping and praising God. Did any of you ever do physio? Yeah. <laughs> This guy, um, this is incredible, right? I mean, there's a whole bunch of miracles going on here. We're going to actually talk about this in a couple of weeks when we get to, you know, guess who I ran into at the Pool of Siloam. This guy, 38 years crippled and up, he jumps and he's walking like, how did those legs work? Well, it's another miracle too. And so the whole crowd gathers and stuff. And by the end of chapter three, you get to chapter four. They see this crowd, there's a big mess going on, and so they get arrested and dragged before the Sanhedrin, okay? So then in chapter 4, they get warned, stop preaching the name of this guy, this Jesus guy, stop it, stop it. And so what happens? What do Peter and John say? Let's uh, quickly read this in uh, Acts 4, 18. Uh, then they called him in again and commanded them not to t speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God, for we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they left them go. Uh, they could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. He... Wow. He had been lame since birth, and he was, he was there outside of the temple every day. Somebody brought him, dropped him off so he could beg. So who saw him? Who recognized him? Everybody. He was at the temple every day begging. And wow, 40 years worth. And now here he is walking and leaping and praising God. It's amazing stuff. We cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard, Peter and John say. And of course, that means everything about Jesus, right? That's what they've seen and heard. It's not about this guy, okay? That was a blessing to this fellow, and it's a miraculous sign. A samion is the Greek word, too, all right? And so then in chapter 5, they're not quitting. They're not stopping. They're, they're keeping on preaching. And then uh, after further threats, I just read this. The man who miraculous healed was over 40 years old, okay? So they get rested again, and there's a second warning uh, chapter 5, verses 18 to 32. They arrested the apostles, put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the full message of this new life. So at daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they've been told, began to teach the people. High priests and associates arrived. They called together the Sanhedrin again, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, they couldn't find them. They were gone. All right. Um, hang on, I skipped a part. Okay, yeah. So we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. All right? Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Because that's what we're saying. The leaders, the Jewish leaders, they insisted. Jesus was crucified. He was put to death, you know, because of them. Now, they bring in a guy named Gamaliel. This fellow is a, a teacher. He's a rabbi. He's highly respected. And, and, and we want to note this guy for two reasons. One, what he says here earlier. But two, we're going to find out 
that this fellow is the rabbi that trained the apostle Paul. Okay, his name is Saul, and we're going to see him later. And so look at the wisdom of this guy. Therefore, they call him in. He gives wisdom. What do we do about these guys? They won't shut up. They keep talking about this Galilean named Jesus from Nazareth, right? Therefore, says Gamaliel, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if, listen to this logic. This is amazing. If their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it's from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. And his speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Like this is no big deal, right? To have them whipped, flogged. And then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So we see that this Gamaliel guy is a wise fellow, and he's the one that trains the Apostle Paul. He was a disciple of Gamaliel. And the results, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Like, I, wow, if I got beaten for being a Christian, what would my attitude be? I'd, I'd want to tell, you know, I got beaten. Did you hear that I got beaten? I got flogged. Did, you, did everybody hear that? Poor me, right? Poor me. No, they rejoiced. They rejoiced because they've been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name, the name of Jesus. And day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped, never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Amazing stuff, the attitude, right? Boy, if only, if only. All right, uh, we skipped over. We're going to go back in chapter 5 to the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And uh, I, I just want to point out something to you first at the end of chapter 4 before we go there. Um, look at chapter 4. You got your Bibles open? Chapter 4 and at verse 36. The last, you know what, actually let's jump back a little bit. Verse 34. There were no needy persons among them, for from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sale, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Wow. Joseph, this guy's name is Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas. Did you know that his real name was Joseph? Barnabas was a nickname, he, which means Barnabas, bar, son of Bar Nabas, bar, son of encouragement, sold a field he owned, brought it the money, brought the money and put it at the disciples' feet. So a number of people did this. You know, people were more well off when it got to a point when there was a big need because they had these people coming from everywhere and hanging out. And so Barnabas did this. His real name is Joseph. And so this couple named Ananias and Sapphira saw it and then thought, oh my goodness. Look at all the glory those guys are getting. Ooh, look at how everybody looks to them. Oh, wow. Ah, we want some of that glory. Yeah. Oh, that will be glory for me. Do you know that song? You know, it's not what it means, but anyway. So here they are, chapter five. You read the story. We're not going to read through all that. Time is going. Uh, they sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you've lied to the, what? Lied to the Holy Spirit. What was the actual crime? Lying to the Holy Spirit. Did they, how much of the money, they sold this property, how much of the money did they have to give to the church? No, they, they, whatever they wanted, whatever they wanted. They had agreed that they would give part, but tell everybody they gave it all. That's the lie. That's the lie, okay? They would get more glory. Um, didn't it belong to you before it was sold? After it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You've not lied to men, but to God. You could have done everything, anything you wanted. You didn't have to do this but they lied. They pretended it was all when really it was part so they could get all the glory. That was what it was about. So it's crazy, crazy. And then 
boom, he's over and dead. <clears throat> and so guys go and carry his body out somewhere. And, uh, and then she comes in and, hey, did you buy pro sell property? Yeah, did you, you know, yeah, I did. Oh, yes, absolutely. That's how much we got. Here you go. Isn't that great? Isn't that generous of us? And Peter says, you know, the same guys that just carried out your husband's body, yeah, they just came back. Now they'll carry out your body. Plunk. Gone. Yikes. Now, what do we learn from this story? What do you think? You tell me. What do we learn from this story? Lying can be worse than the actual offense. Yeah, the lying can be worse than the actual offense, okay, for sure. What else? Anything else? You can't lie to God. You can't lie to God. Why would anybody think they can? Right? Doesn't he already know? Yeah, absolutely he does. Now, this is interesting. God's, here's what we learned. God's church must be pure and holy to get it moving. We're off. We need to get off on the right foot. And so if you want to be generous, be generous. That's fine. That's great. If you can't be, well, no, you should all be generous whether you have a little or a lot. Just that somebody with a lot can be more generous than somebody with a little. But remember what Jesus, when he saw the woman that had just the two pennies, he said that she gave more than all the guys with their big you know, money bags because she gave all she had. So when God looks and sees, he doesn't see the amount of the gift. He sees the size of the sacrifice because this woman gave everything. So that's a bigger sacrifice than the guy that gave like a million times more, but he still had a million left over. So yeah, interesting. Uh, another thing, does this story remind you of something in the Old Testament? Anybody? Yes, and what happened? Yeah. So the first city in the, whole, in, the, in the promised land was Jericho, and what were they told? God's going to knock down the walls. You wipe out the wicked, wicked, wicked people, but then don't take anything. And the one guy, remember his name was Achan, he came across like gold bar, silver, wonderful, loving clothing and stuff. It was all his size, like, oh my goodness. And so off he went and took it. And his whole family knew about it because it was hidden under their tent and everything. And, and, uh, and they lost the next battle. Why, God, says Joshua, why? You know, and God says, because there's sin in the camp. So at the start of the promised land, we need some purity here. And now here at the start of the church, we need to be pure, okay? So the story there of Jericho and Achan, it's in Joshua chapter 7, if you will. God's starting something new, like it better get off on the right foot. It better get off with purity and holiness. The church must be pure. All right. That's chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. The, the, the crime was not that they only gave part of the property. They could give whatever they wanted. The crime was lying to God as they said, here, this is the whole amount. Aren't we generous? No, you're liars, actually. All right, so that's chapter 5. Chapter 6 is the choosing of the seven first deacons. What's the problem? Well, let's read it, actually. Chapter 7, are you with me? No, chapter 6, sorry. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Okay, stop, look up. So what's happening? We got these people, they're from all around the Mediterranean, all around the Roman world, all around the known world, if you will. And they've come, they're mostly Jewish people that are now living elsewhere. They've come, they've, they're turning to Jesus. It's amazing, they're staying. Uh, you've got two groups. You've got the locals, okay, who are called Hebraic in this verse, right? So they speak Hebrew and Aramaic, which is close, right? They speak that. But then you got all these people from all the other places, and their main language is Greek, right? Now, they might also speak Egyptian and Latin and whatever, but Greek is the language you spoke when you traveled, because that's what everybody spoke, 
People spoke multiple languages, you know. So anyway, you've got all these Greek-speaking people, which means they're from out of town, and you got these Hebraic, they're Aramaic-speaking people, which are the locals. And, and the ones that are most in need are the widows. That makes sense, right? So the widows are there. And so there's a complaint that the local widows, the Hebraic ones, they're getting all the food, and all the widows from out of town are getting ripped off. You know, they're not getting taken care of like the rest. It's Do you ever see a problem with your kids or people at work when they start comparing? Does that ever cause problems? People start comparing? That's what's happening here. Okay, let's keep reading what happens. Uh, So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them, and we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. Why did Jesus train us in the Word and teach us all this stuff? He wants us to keep preaching the Word and leading in prayer, right? And this proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. So this is all of them. This is Stephen, right? And, okay, let me go. Uh, Okay, Stephen and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Pumbaa and Nicholas and anybody get those? Timon? Oh, never mind. Uh, Parmenaeus and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God spread and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. A large number of priests became obedient to the faith too. Priests, everybody, amazing. So the problem is there's this dispute about, you know, who's getting enough food and they're turning it into an ethnic thing, which I'm sure, I don't know, I wasn't there. Uh, I'm not that old. And the solution is, let's recruit some other people, but it's not a show of hands. Let's look at who can come and take over this issue. Choose seven men to help, they said. What are the qualities they needed? Seven men among you who are known to be full of the Spirit, full of wisdom, all right, will turn and known to be. So they had a good reputation. People knew these guys, a good reputation. They're filled with the Spirit, filled with wisdom, and we'll turn the responsibility over to them and give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. And that's great. And really, that's how a church should work. People doing different jobs, you know, and helping out in different ways as they're gifted and qualified. And by the way, this is, we call these guys, these seven guys, deacons. And the word deacon literally means servant. The, it's a compound Greek word, diakonos, diakonos, deacon. And dia is through, like what do you call the line through the middle of a circle? The diameter, right? Sorry, yeah, a couple names. But diameter, dia, through the middle. Dia is through, and konos means dust. And so somebody who's scurrying around to serve so much, they're kicking up the dust. They're running through the dust, and it's kicking up off their feet because they're so, in such a hurry to serve. That's a beautiful picture, isn't it? Diakona, diakonos, deacon, through dust, you know, kicking up the f- dust from their feet. So that's what a deacon is here, a servant. And now in our church, we, we see them as being their spiritual care servants in that way, prayer and, and uh, helping folks in that way too. So that's the story there, and it's great. Who were chosen? It's interesting. Who were the ones complaining? Which group was complaining? The out-of-towners, right? The Greek-speaking ones. And every one of these names are Greek names. So they, so they picked these uh, Grecian, you know, the guys from out-of-town who also have Greek names to be the deacons and take care of these, uh, this situation uh, to make sure it, it would be taken care of. And of course, the two that we know about are Stephen, who gets stoned to death, that's what we're going to look at next, and then Philip, who travels around, he's the one that goes to Samaria, and he's preaching and teaching as we talk about Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, he's the guy. All right, so now chapter 7, that's chapter 6. Chapter 7 is the story of this Stephen, the first deacon, and he's out there. Who is he? We read here, Acts 6, 8. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace 
and power did wonders and miraculous signs among the people. And so when a crowd sees their mirac- these miraculous signs and gathers, Stephen starts preaching to them, okay? Because whether it's Jesus or anybody else, when there's a miracle, a miraculous sign, is that the point, the miracle? Is that the point? Did Jesus come to do miracles? No, those things are signs that point to Jesus, right? He did this and then he taught, right? In John, there's a miracle, a miraculous sign, a samion, and then a discourse. He talks about it. I feed you with bread, I'm the bread of life, right? I raise Lazarus, I'm the resurrection and the life. And so here, Stephen, there's miracles happening through Stephen, the first deacon, and then when the crowd gathers, he starts preaching. Now, all their messages in these early days, whether it's Peter in Acts 2, Stephen here in Acts 7, uh, all their messages are very pointed. Like, God has done this and this and this throughout history, and then God finally sent Jesus, his son, and you killed him! (laughs) How is that going to go over, right? You killed him. The Jewish leaders killed him. You guys did this. And so they're upset. And so with this Stephen, here's what we read, chapter 6, right? Uh, Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. Interesting. I'm sure he didn't. I mean, they secretly persuaded them to lie and say these things. And so then eventually... Stephen preaches to all of them, and throughout chapter 7, at the end of chapter 7, then, they're stoning him. Let's actually go to there, 754, okay? Chapter 7, verse 54. Uh, When they heard this, okay, let (laughs) let me back up to verse 51. Let's see if this was aimed at you, if you might be upset. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears. You are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? Like, would that go over well with you? What do you think if this was pointed right at you, the Jewish leaders? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. That would be the prophets. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law and were, that was put into effect through angels, but have not obeyed it. Now, when they heard this, verse 54, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God. God knew it was happening. Opened a window for him to see into heaven. Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Well, at this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, listen to this, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Whoa. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. What is that reminiscent of? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Oh, isn't that nice? He fell asleep. No, 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 no. What, what does this Greek, it's a Greek euphemism, meaning what? Yeah. Died, died. So we see this in various places through the New Testament. We say they passed away. Away to where? No, that's our euphemism for, you know, we don't want to say they died. We say they passed away. They didn't want to say they died. They say he fell asleep. Remember Lazarus? He fell asleep. Oh, good. Then I'll wake up. No, Jesus says he died. And for your sakes, I'm glad he died because then you can see the glory and as he goes. Okay, so this is Stephen. And note that he saw Jesus in heaven before a single stone was thrown. And, and when he said that, look, I see the heaven open and there's Jesus at the right hand of the Father. And that just threw them into an even greater tizzy. All right. Now, here's the question. And we're going to have another question in a few minutes when we get to James, one of the 12. Stephen wasn't one of the 12 apostles. He was certainly one of the disciples that followed, not one of the 12. And he becomes the first deacon in the church here. Why does God allow him to be stoned? 
And of course, this is a question always we ask when we see somebody that's taken too early, it seems, or there's a tragedy and stuff. And, and it's a question that we all have in our humanity, too, in our humanity. But we read in the very next verse in Acts chapter 8, it says this, on that day. Okay? So, you, I mean, that phrase means that these are connected, right? On that very day, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered where? Where? Throughout where? Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. And so where was the gospel supposed to go? Jerusalem, where they've been hanging around, and then to Judea and Samaria. So this is God lighting the fire under them and kicking them out so that they'll go, and wherever they went, what's the next verse? Uh, Godly men buried Stephen. Uh, Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Amazing. So God is using this to get them gone and sharing the gospel, leaving Jerusalem and going where he wanted them to go. All right, good. The persecution begins. Who gets scattered? All except the apostles, scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. So you know what? It's the lay people sharing the gospel. It's not the trained 12. It's the lay people going and sharing the gospel, not the professionals. Okay? Got that? All right. Now, the persecution begins. It starts with the stoning of Stephen, and the mob is all worked up, and this persecution goes everywhere. They're looking for every Christian now. Off they get scattered. They go off. They're preaching. That's great. But public enemy number one is here. Here is this young guy, Saul. And when they're stoning Stephen, he's, he's young. He's watching the coats of the guy who's taken off their coats so they can throw bigger stones and whip them harder to kill Stephen. And he, they leave their coats with him. That's the first place we see him. Now, next chapter, verse 3, Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. What men and women? Christians. Followers of the way. They're not called Christians yet, okay? By the time our night is done, we'll see where they're first called Christians. Now they're called followers of the way. Followers of this Nazarene, Jesus, you know, but it's called the way initially here. And so he's grabbing them and he's throwing them in prison. Now, as they're scattered... As they're scattered with this persecution, one of the deacons, the guy named Philip, we saw Stephen and Philip and then five more Greek-named guys, Philip, he gets scattered and he goes into Samaria. And while he's there, he is preaching, proclaiming the name of Christ, performing miraculous signs, people are being healed, and then God takes him down to the road that goes from uh, Jerusalem down towards Egypt and around into Africa, where he's, he's, he's jogging along, and this Ethiopian, the treasurer of the whole country of Ethiopia, right? The treasurer of the country of Ethiopia, he's been in Jerusalem, he's got a scroll of Isaiah, And he's in his chariot, you know, with his entourage, whatever, and he's reading it. And uh, Philip, who's been preaching in in, uh, Samaria, and there's a whole story there that you read, but now he's kind of jogging along, comes up close to the chariot, and he hears this guy reading out loud, I guess, and he says, do you understand what you're reading? And the guy says, well, how can I, unless somebody explains it to me? So Philip up into the chariot, and he starts talking. The guy's reading from Isaiah 53. Surely he bore our sorrows, our griefs. The the punishment that brought us peace was on him. All this stuff. Who's he talking about? Isaiah, you know, himself or somebody else. And so Philip is able to share Jesus coming out of this Old Testament prophecy in Isaiah 53. Amazing. And I like the next part. Uh, So the guy believes. He believes in Jesus. You know, obviously he's already a seeker and he's looking for God. He hears about Jesus. He believes because then he says, obviously there's not everything is captured here because he says, hey, there's water. What's keeping me from being baptized? 
holy cow, you've been a Christian like five seconds, right? We're, we're, we'll be having baptisms in uh, June, second Sunday, I think it's the ninth. And I had somebody who's a brand new Christian, they're saying, I don't know about getting baptized, you know, how long do you have to wait? I said, we're going to talk about a guy on Wednesday night who waited like five seconds. So if you put your faith in Jesus, you get baptized now. You get baptized anytime. And uh, so that's what happens. So here's this Ethiopian treasure. And then boom, Philip is caught away and taken somewhere else. So we've got Philip. Great guy. And uh, one of the first deacons, Stephen and Philip, are the only two of the seven deacons that we know anything about. But here with Philip, the gospel has gone Jerusalem, Judea, and with Philip to what's next above? Samaria. Yeah, Samaria. Okay, uh, let's jump to chapter 10, all right? Chapter 9 is interesting. We'll come back to that. Chapter 9 is the story of Saul's conversion on the road to Damascus. So tonight, Peter is the main guy. Next week, part 2 starts actually back in chapter 9, where Paul becomes the main guy. So I'll, I'm going to ask you before, as you're preparing for next week, Maybe reread chapter 9, because it's going to be about Paul next week, right? All right, let's go to chapter 10. All right, the Holy Spirit for the Gentiles. Chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes to the Jews. All right, here's Peter with two keys. Who does the first sermon? What do we call that day the Holy Spirit comes to the church, who are all Jews at that point? What do we call that day? The day of Pentecost, right? Pentecost, birthday of the church, Holy Spirit comes on. They're all Jews. Peter's got two keys. Yeah, it doesn't say two keys, but all the picture. Because here's the first key, opening the door, Peter's sermon, 3,000 people. Now in chapter 10, Peter is called to go to a Gentile. He's a Roman centurion who is up in Caesarea Maritima. Now let me show you. Cornelius is up in Caesarea, and Peter is down in Joppa. Let me show you a map. You ready? Have you seen that map before? Like every Sunday. So you can see on this map, here is Joppa, that's where Peter is, and here is Caesarea, further up the Mediterranean coast, and that's where Cornelius is. Caesarea has kind of this man-made harbor that's there, so when the Romans were sending in troops or the new governor or whatever, they would come to Caesarea Maritima, maritime, you know, like on the coast, on the water, Caesarea Maritima, and so that's, that's where you'd expect to see a Roman centurion, and he's there, he's a godly man, well, we're going to talk about that. So, but let me show you pictures of both these places today, okay, so let's start with Caesarea Maritima, it's a city and the port built by Herod the Great, you know, the guy that built the temple or refurbished the temple and did all kinds of stuff because he was actually Edomian, Edomite, and not Jew. And he's the guy that killed the babies, right, when Jesus was born. So the Roman headquarters was there, so Cornelius and Centurion was there. So this is the amphitheater that Herod built, still there today, okay? And uh, there at Caesarea Maritima, this was where the palace would have been that looked out, and you can see it would have been pretty grand. And uh, you, it's on the coast, so it's all seawater. So this was an aqueduct that bought, brought water from Mount Carmel. Remember Elijah and the prophets of Baal? That's up on Mount Carmel, so it brought water down from there. But there was, there was an earthquake, and so that, some of that got toppled. Herod had built an artificial harbor here at Caesarea. There's not a natural harbor there, and the remains of it were sunk into the... You can see part of it, but the rest were sunk when this um, earthquake came. So that's, that's where Cornelius is, up in Caesarea Maritima. And further down in Joppa is where the Apostle Paul is. All right? This is the ancient city of Joppa. It's where Jonah went and jumped on the boat to go the opposite direction towards Tarshish in Spain. And it's where Peter is here in Acts chapter 10 when God shows him this vision, which we'll talk about in a moment, says kill and eat. And Cornelius' men arrive immediately following. All right? So this is the port of Joppa right on the coast. And down this small street is the home of Simon the Tanner, we're told. Down this little street, and you go down there, and you see this door, and you read it, House of Simon the Tanner, Der Gerber in German, and, uh, and the door's locked. Ugh! I wanted to go in there. I wanted to go up on the roof and see if I could see a sheet. 
you know, but no, didn't happen. So here's what's going on. This Cornelius, he's up in Caesarea. He's a seeker. He's a, he's a godly man, the Bible says. He helps the poor. He does all kinds of stuff, and he's wanting to know God better, right? Meanwhile, Peter, and so God says to him, you know, like, send some men down to Joppa, to the house of Simon the Tanner, and there's a guy there that'll come and tell you about me. And so Peter, meanwhile, he's up on the roof, lounging, got the chaise going, and you know, this is great. And he sees this vision of this sheet with all kinds of animals on it, unclean animals and clean animals, and God says, take and eat. And he goes, no, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean. I've never had bacon. Poor guy. You know, I've never, never eaten anything unclean. And so God says, kill and eat. No, no. Three times God shows him this sheet, and then and God says to him, don't call unclean what I call clean. Now, I'm thankful for that because I like bacon, and that's what we look at, at least in part, of why it's okay for us to eat the animals that God had said in the Old Testament were unclean. I mean, there are other reasons the Apostle Paul will talk about, we'll look at when we get into his letters, but that's one of the reasons why we say, it's all right, you go ahead and eat shellfish, and go ahead and eat pork, you know, and various things. Because God said to Peter, take and eat, but, but actually that was as well, that was an illustration, because God says, there are guys coming, they're at the door, they want you to go to a Gentile's house, what? Go with them. And immediately... There's a knock on the door. Here are these three guys from Cornelius say, please, can you come with us? And Peter knows God just told me, yep, I should go. Because the Jewish person would not go into a Gentile's house. You just wouldn't do that. You know, you'd be unclean. You couldn't go to the temple or the synagogue unclean. Okay, so what are we looking at? Let's talk about Cornelius for a minute. All right, he's up, Caesarea up there is the Roman headquarters. We showed the amphitheater and all the various things that were there. All right, and he's a centurion, which means he's commander of a hundred men, sent, hundred, centurion, he's commander of a hundred men, all right? He's a God-fearing guy. You know, while you write these things down, let me read, okay? Uh, at, Sin at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need. He prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, Cornelius stared at him in fear, wouldn't you? And he said, what is it, Lord? The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He's staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. And when the angel had spoke to him, had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants, told them everything that happened and sent them down to Joppa. Got it? Pretty cool, huh? Pretty cool. All right, so that is, that is Cornelius. He's a Gentile. He's a Roman, okay? Up until now, they've pretty much all been Jews. Here's the key. Peter preaches day of Pentecost to the Jews to come to Jesus. All right, now at the same time, there's the vision of Peter. I already talked to you about that. You know, Peter's in Joppa, up on the roof of this place, you know, Simon the Tanner's house, God's preparing Peter for what's to come as he has that vision of the sheet with all different kinds of animals, and God instructs him three times to kill and eat. And just then, when that third vision, the third vision of the sheet is there, kill and eat, don't call unclean what I call clean, God says. That's the point, including these Gentiles are going to be right there, go with them. And so he does. Um, because there's a new covenant now, and it's based not on like a thousand rules, like in the Old Testament, and, um, and it starts not with food, I mean, it starts with people, you know, like here are, you know, you Jews, and you wouldn't talk to a Gentile unless you really had to, you wouldn't go into his house, you know, that kind of stuff, and then, so forget that. 
Gentiles are not unclean. You know, I love them too. Jesus died for them too. And so then it goes to other things too that were part of the rules. Mitch, question? Yeah, Jesus says in Mark 7, 18 and 19 that everything is clean. So there are a whole bunch of things that Jesus did that didn't follow the man-made rules, mostly. Joel? I find that the thing of Peter, it seems like he has to be pulled three times. <laughs> everything. <laughs> That's a good point. Joel says that uh, Peter seems to, be ha- seems to have to be told three times <laughs> pretty much everything. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, right, so then the, there's a sermon of Peter to Cornelius. Cornelius, when Peter gets there with the three guys that he sent, he preaches to them as well, tells them all about Jesus, who he is, what he's done for them. Uh, verses 34 to 47, it's a big statement. There's been a big change. God sent me to come to you Gentiles. Jesus, God loves the Gentiles too. It's amazing stuff. God doesn't show favoritism you know, is part of what he says there as well. And so the bottom line, everyone that believes will be received forgiveness of sin. All right. And, uh, okay, have you got that? Nope. Okay, I'll give you a moment. I'll wait till two-thirds are looking up again. Okay, moving on. So here's Peter, right? The Holy Spirit comes to the Gentiles here in Acts chapter 10. Who's the guy that preaches the message? Who's the guy that tells them? It's Peter. While Peter's preaching, uh, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard his message. Circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on, even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Oh, and then again, then Peter said, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They've received the Holy Spirit just as we have, so they ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days, obviously to teach them, which Peter did. All right, now a couple random sort of things. Back in chapter five, the first time the word church is used, Jesus had used it, but the first time here it's used uh, for the church. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events, Okay. But here's the big one. We get to chapter 11. Chapter 10 is Cornelius, the second key from Peter, opens the church to the Gentiles, right? And uh, here in chapter 11, uh, we go up. Okay, picture the map again, right? And on the map, we had Joppa, and then go up the coast to Caesarea Maritima, right? Keep going way, 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 way up the coast, and you get to a city called Antioch. It's in Syria, Antioch. And so believers are coming, and growing, and this church has Jews and Gentiles in it. And so Barnabas, what's his real name? Joseph. Barnabas is sent up there to kind of be the pastor of the church, and his church is growing like crazy. And so he says, I need help. Saul has become a Christian already, he, back in chapter 9, and he's gone home to Tarsus, which is, which is way up the coast and around a little bit in Turkey. So Barnabas goes to Turkey, to Tarsus, and when he found him, Saul, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church, taught great numbers of people, and the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. First called Christians. Now, by the way, I'm proud to be a Christian to be called a Christian. I trust you are too, right? That wasn't the idea then. This was, this was a, a slander. This was why well, you're just a little, a little Christ. The word Christian means little Christ. Yeah, you're, you're trying to be a little Jesus. And so they were trying to, this was an attack. You're a, you're a little Christ. I don't know if they said thank you or if they said stop it. And I, I, but they were first called Christians there as an attacking word there in Antioch. Okay. Good. Now, there's some things, a little bit about the church in Antioch. Uh, It's where the first time Christians are called Christians. There were Greeks that lived there, and a great many of them believed. 
uh, the church leaders, James, Jesus' half-brother, and Peter and the others sent Barnabas to go up there, see what's going on. And Barnabas and Saul taught there for a year. And you know what happened at the end of that year? While they were worshiping and praising God, the Holy Spirit said, set apart Barnabas and Saul. I'm sending them on a missions trip. First mission trip ever. That's where we'll start next week. Okay? Uh, and then we'll read one more story in chapter 12. I'll let you jot that. Let me read. It was about that time that King Herod, so we're up in, way up in Antioch, let's go back down to Jerusalem. It was about that time that King Herod, now this wasn't the Herod that killed the babies, this was like his grandson, who's now king, uh, he arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, okay, put to death with the sword. Yikes. Okay, put to death with the sword. And when he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. Now, this happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers, 16 soldiers guarding him. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly, here's the key, the church was earnestly praying to God for him. And the night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Four shifts of uh, six hours, right? Four soldiers, two he's chained directly to. Amazing. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Hey, get up! Struck him on the side. I like that. Didn't say he tapped him on the shoulder because he was asleep, right? Must have been a heavy sleeper. W woke him up. Quick, get up, he said. And the chains fell off Peter's wrists. And then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out the prison, but he had no idea what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was just seeing a vision. Like, is this real? Pinch me, right? Pinch me. Uh, they passed the first. And the second guards, they came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. And when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark. He's the guy we're going to see next week that goes with Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey, but then he deserts them. So they go to his mother's house. And, and this is where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, oh, so overjoyed she ran back in without opening the door and claimed Peter's at the door. Well, let him in, right? <laughs> Peter's at the door. Um, you're out of your mind, they told her. But when she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. Oh, they killed him early. It's only his angel at the door. But Peter kept on knocking. <laughs> Hello, you know I'm here. <laughs> I love that. Kept knocking. When they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned them with his hand for them to be quiet. He described how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. Tell James the brother and the brothers about this, he said, and then he left for another place. Wow. Now, I love how it finishes. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. <laughs> After that, Herod did a thorough search made for him, did not find him, cross-examined the guards, and ordered that they be executed. Ouch. Ouch, ouch. All right. Oops, I should have shown you that. Okay, that's what we just read. I, I, don't, I don't understand. We don't understand. Why was Stephen killed after he's been, just been elected, appointed as one of the first deacons? Why is James, one of the 12, he's trained for three and a half years by Jesus just to die, never gets out of Jerusalem. Like, why is that? I don't know. And yet at the same time, Peter is miraculously rescued, saves, and lives on. So that's up to chapter 12. Okay, that's the first part. Peter is the main guy to this point. All right? So the gospel spread from, help me here, Jerusalem to Judea 
and Samaria, and next week to the ends of the world. All right, and we'll talk about that next week. All right, good. You guys are great. Yeah, this is exciting stuff, isn't it? Yes, Brian. Yes, it is. (laughs) All right, let's pray. Father, thanks so much for your word. Thanks for sending Luke, Dr. Luke, to go and research, and we're going to see next week that he's actually there and traveling with Paul on some of these trips, and and Lord, we're grateful that we have his gospel that tells us about Jesus' life, and now this book that tells us about how the gospel spread after Jesus went back to heaven. Thank you, Father, for the courage that happens when we truly meet you, to see the change in Peter from the cowardly, blustering, presumptuous guy to this guy who is bold and listening to you and not afraid to get flogged or imprisoned or or to even break some of the taboos when you have spoken to him and he goes and speaks to a Gentile in the Gentile's house. Lord, open our ears to what you would say to us. May we be bold while being gentle and respectful as we have opportunities to share too. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. How can we do that? Because we have the Holy Spirit too. Amen? Amen. All right, good night.